and I'm going to share my screen with you, and we will get started. In fact, we will begin with the uh, the handout that I uh, sent to you, um, the plots for the week. Um, so we'll start on uh, the first page of Wednesday, where it says application number one. And I will share that with you. So if you can't find it for some reason, you can just see it on the screen once I share it. Uh, but I have to actually first mirror my uh, iPad here. Okay, so application number one, again, this is under the uh, plots for week two lecture that uh, I downloaded at the beginning of the week. So what we're going to be doing right now with this problem is we're going to be applying what we learned yesterday about quadratic functions in uh, a word problem, uh, a little simple application uh, where quadratics are applied. So this is an application for uh, quadratic functions. So remember, quadratic functions are those degree two polynomials where the highest exponent is two, and then we can get a little bit of information about the actual function from the equation itself. So you can see here that the equation that's given has a power of two in it. And it looks slightly different than all the equations from yesterday because yesterday everything was x and y. But here, you know, it doesn't really make a difference if you have x or not. You just have to have a variable with a power of 2. So here we have p to the 2 power. So the problem, I'll just read through it real quick. Suppose that the manufacturer of a, a gas clothes dryer has found that when the unit price is p dollars, the revenue r in dollars is given by this equation here, okay? And this type of um, word problem is an example of mathematical modeling where you can model real life data uh, if there's some kind of pattern to it. And typically in business, there, there is a pattern between what you're charging to sell something and how much money you're going to make. So it kind of makes sense that if your price is too high, then the money you're gonna make is probably gonna be lower then if the price that you charge is lower than whatever that was. So there's some sort of pattern to that. Okay, so let's make sure we understand our variables. So little p, remember, is just the price. And r of p, which is really what we mean when we say y, all right? So that would be uh, the revenue. All right, and revenue, if you're not familiar with that, that's just what you make in sales, all right? So that's, that's your sales money. So if you sell something and you make money from that, that's revenue. Uh, but revenue is before you deduct taxes though, all right? So this is before you deduct taxes, before you deduct costs, stuff like that, okay? Oh, and also one other thing, our price here, that's like our X, all right? And revenue is like our Y. This way you can relate it to maybe variables that are maybe more familiar to you. Okay, something else you might want to identify in this equation because it's quadratic. So just like yesterday, it's probably going to be helpful to identify the ABC values. So remember the A term uh, is from the square term. So that would be the negative four. The B term comes from the middle term, which in this case would be 4,000 P or just 4,000. And there is no third term in this equation, so the C value would be zero. So now what are some things that we would be interested in with this particular problem? So first question, how about we identify the coordinates of the y-intercept and interpret it? So if you remember from quadratics yesterday, the y-intercept is, is it A, B, or C? So think about that, see if you remember it. Right, hopefully remember it's the c value so in this case it's zero which means really zero comma zero all right now of course because it's a word problem i will ask you to interpret the meaning of this so remember that 
the two numbers that you see there are, yeah, they're X and Y values, but remember, X is little p, it's the price, and the Y value is the revenue that you make at that price. Okay, so now let's write a sentence to explain what this means. So start with the first number. When P is zero, that means when the price of, what is this, a dryer, right? It's a dryer. So when the price of a dryer is zero dollars, how much revenue are you going to make? That's the second number, okay? So then your revenue is also zero dollars. And that makes sense, right? If, if you're giving away these things for free, you're making zero dollars. All right, number two, what's something else we might be interested in? How about the vertex? So question A here. So first off, is the vertex in this problem at the top of the curve or at the bottom of the curve? So remember with quadratic functions, the curves look like this. And the vertex is either the top point or the bottom point. And it depends if it opens down or if it opens up. So the vertex in this problem is gonna actually look like this. How do I know that? Well, first, the vertex is the maximum point. Since what? How do I know this curve is going to open down? Can you see anything that I wrote down that gives that away? I hope you remember that it's the A value. So if you look at the A value, what is it? It's negative. So remember, the A value determines the direction of the curve. So we would say since A is negative. Now, if you're a mathematician, you would just write A is less than zero, which means A is negative. All right, so now, what are the coordinates of this vertex? And of course, we're gonna interpret the meaning of these coordinates, all right? So now remember, X is really price and Y is really revenue. So remember that when you get these two numbers, how you can just name them. The price is whatever X is, your revenue is whatever your Y is. Now, more specifically, when we say uh, that it's our revenue, it's the maximum revenue that we're gonna make. So remember that. Okay, so now let's find the coordinates. How do you find the coordinates of the vertex for X? So remember the formula, it's negative B divided by 2A. So it would be negative, 4,000, right, because it's negative and the B value, so it's negative and 4,000, so negative 4,000 over 2 times negative 4. And that is negative 4,000 divided by negative 8 is 5,000. Oh, no, 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 no. Sorry, too many zeros. That's 500, 500. Now remember, what is X in this problem? It's P, it's the price. All right, and remember the second coordinate, our Y value is the revenue. So what do we have to do to get that? We have to plug in 500 into the equation. So we have to do, uh, not well, not F, uh, it's R of 500. It's the same thing as saying F of 500, all right? So now remember the equation is up here in the box. So you have to do negative four times your p-value squared. So it's negative four times 500 squared plus 4,000 times our p-value of 500. Okay, now remember your order of operations here. Um, if, if you're just doing this in your head, you'd have to square 500 first. Right, you'd have to square 500 first. Uh, but you could also just type this in exactly as you see it on your calculator. But you must use parentheses. All right, I don't put the parentheses there to be neat. I put them there for a reason. So when you use the calculator to do something like that, 
make sure you use the parentheses as well. Okay. All right, so let's do that on the calculator. So I'm going to share my calculator with you now. So we'd have to type in negative four. Oops, no decimal, sorry. Negative four, and then times parentheses, uh, 500, close parentheses, squared. And then plus uh, 4,000 times 500. Now, for the last part, I really don't need parentheses because there's no exponent. All right, and what number is that? It's one with six zeros. That's one million. All right, one million. So let's go back to the notes. All right, and let's fill that in. All right, so remember that's the y value, but also remember the y value is our revenue. Okay, so now specifically, all right, we don't want to just say that when the price is $500, the revenue is a million. That is correct in saying that, but there's one other word we should really add to that statement. All right, so our interpretation is this when the price of the dryer is $500. So there's your X value. The maximum revenue. The reason why it's maximum is because it's at the vertex. It's going to climb no higher than the vertex point. So the maximum revenue will be a million bucks. All right, so according to this model, what that is saying is that you will never make more than a million dollars for this particular product, okay? You will never make more than a million dollars for this particular product, according to this model, all right? <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna give you a minute there to catch up since there was a lot of writing. And then we're gonna do a third question and then we're gonna do our first group work. All right, so as you're writing, if you are still writing, again, just to kind of picture this graph, it's gonna have that particular shape because it's opening down and at the vertex, all right, we have those coordinates of 500 and a million. Uh, so that would be, if I can squeeze this in here, one, two, three, six zeros. All right, notice again, it's at the top of the curve, which means the revenue will not be any more than a million dollars. Now, another way of interpreting that is this. If you were to decrease your price of 500 or increase your price of 500, you're gonna be coming down that parabola. So what does that imply? If your price is less than 500 or even more than 500, your revenue will be less than a million dollars because if you're on the curve, the curve is gonna go lower than the vertex. So if you change the price to something else, the revenue will be less than a million, no matter what you charge. All right, so, so let's add that. So if you change P to any other value, revenue will be less than a million dollars. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, what if I make the price $1,000? Yeah, you know, won't I make more money? And according to this model, the answer is no. Because think about it. If if you want to buy something, you know, and you think that the price is too high, you're not going to buy it. You're going to find a better deal. So this particular product will sell best if the price of it is $500. If you make the price too high, you will actually sell fewer models and therefore make less money. So it's not that, oh, let's charge more, we'll make more money. You actually will lose money by doing that because your price at one point will be too high and nobody will buy it. Unless they got the money, but I don't. <laughs> not on this salary. 
All right, let's go to the next question here, question C. All right, one last thing we want to get from this particular function is the x-intercept. All right, if any. All right, so remember that it's possible that a curve will not have an x-intercept, all right? So that, that, that just happens, remember, when your square root has a negative number inside of it. Okay, so how do we find the x-intercept? That's where we let y equal zero. All right, so remember, in this case, that's what? That's the revenue expression. We're gonna let the revenue equal zero. So let's do that. So we'll have zero equals negative four P squared plus 4,000 P. Did I get that right? Is that the right equation? Yes, okay. Just had to double check. All right, and just for the heck of it, let's use the quadratic formula. So remember, we have three options here. We can factor, we can use the quadratic formula, and we can use completing the square. So I'm gonna use the quadratic formula. So, so remember, did you have that song stuck in your head yesterday after class, the pop goes to weasel? I forget, who can we thank for that one? Um, all right, so we have negative of B, all right, so it's negative 4,000 plus or minus the square root of, think about what goes next. Remember, it's B squared minus 4AC, all right? So then it would be B squared, 4,000 squared, minus 4A, and then C. C was zero, so that's gonna cancel out that square root a little bit all over 2a. All right, now let's simplify. We get negative 4,000 plus or minus. So we're gonna get the square root of um, 16 million from squaring that first number uh, plus zero. So that's just 16 million in the square root all over negative eight which equals negative 4,000 plus or minus. Now the square root of 16 million, that's 4,000 all over negative eight. All right, now let's just see how much of this we can just break down by hand. So remember X can have two solutions here. So the first solution is found by adding the tops, All right? So if we add the tops, we get zero. And then if we subtract, that gives us negative 8,000 divided by negative eight is positive 1,000. All right, so I'll give you a second there to catch up, and then we're gonna interpret the meaning of all this. What does this mean about selling the dryers and making money? What does this tell us? So just keep in mind, don't forget here that we're using X for most of this problem, but remember X isn't really the variable, it's P. So it's really, P is what we're solving for. And you have to remember, what does P stand for? The P is the price of the dryer. All right, so now our x-intercepts, right, or really our p-intercepts are where? At zero comma zero and a thousand comma zero. So remember that the first number in each pair is the price and the second number is the revenue. So we actually have two interpretations to make. So interpretation number one, so from zero comma zero, all right. All right, so in your head, complete the sentence. When the price is zero, comma, what? 
So when the price is zero, comma, fill in the blanks. All right, so if you're not sure, remember that now what we're trying to do is describe the second number, all right? So we have, we just wrote down what P is, so the rest of the sentence is describing R. Well, in this case, R is zero, all right? So when the price of the dryers are zero, then the revenue is zero. And that should make sense because if you're charging nothing for the dryers, you're giving them away for free. So of course your revenue would have to be zero. But now for the second one, a thousand comma zero. So remember the first number is the price of the dryer. So pay a thousand bucks for a dryer. This manufacturer is gonna make no money. Cause now this is the, remember how I was telling you a few minutes ago that if your price is too high, nothing's gonna sell, all right? So therefore when the price again is a thousand dollars, it's too high, then the revenue is zero dollars all right they're too expensive nobody's buying them so your company makes nothing for those dryers All right, so at this point, we're actually gonna do our first group work. So we're gonna do problem one, which is broken up in the six questions. All right, so do problem number one uh, and do the, do the whole thing, A, B, C, D, E, and F. All right, so there's six questions all together. They're pretty much the same exact questions as these where you have to find the y-intercept and interpret it, find the vertex and interpret it as a minimum or a maximum, and then find the x-intercept if it exists and then interpret it as well, okay? All right, so I think what we'll do here, uh, I think 30 minutes will be good because I'm sure that some of the questions are gonna be a little tough. And then also this gives you a chance for a little bit of a break early on, which is fine, okay? But let's do 30 minutes with this problem um, and I'll break you into groups as usual. All right, so I th think I can stop sharing. I hope everybody got a chance to copy down everything. Okay, welcome back everybody. Uh, why don't we uh, spend a few minutes just kind of running through those questions that you just went through. I uh, just want to make sure that those are clear and the solutions that you had to uh, find uh, those methods. I hope those were clear and but most importantly, how you interpret your answer. So let, let's just spend a few minutes on that. So I'm going to share uh, the questions there. Okay, so these were the questions about the Callaway Golf Company. Um, so our variables here are the cost C of manufacturing X golf clubs. Um, and it may be expressed by this quadratic function. So again, X is the number of golf clubs that you are making. And then on the left side here, this uh, C of X, meaning the cost of manufacturing X golf clubs, uh, that's just cost in general. Okay, so first you should have at least, you know, thought about the A, B, and C values of the equation, right? So A, B, and C should have been, as you see them there, 4.9, negative 617.4, and positive 19,600 for A, B, C. All right, next, uh, A, find the coordinates of the y-intercept, right? Hopefully that was just simply enough taking your C value but don't forget to write it as zero comma C or whatever the C number is. All right, I'm not gonna tell you everything. All right, I'm gonna just kind of giving you a little hint as we go along. All right, now when you interpret the meaning of the Y-intercept, 
All right. Uh, I don't want you to tell me, oh, it's the point on the graph where it crosses the y axis. That's not acceptable here. All right. So, in terms of the number of golf clubs manufactured and uh, cost, all right. So, your point should have been 0, 19,600. So, you have to use both of those numbers in your statement the zero for your x, right, which is the number of golf clubs manufactured, and then the second number is your cost. So I'll do this first one for you and the other interpretations you'll have to do on your own. So for B, what you should have said is that uh, the cost for manufacturing zero golf clubs is $19,600, something like that. It doesn't have to be this exactly the same wording as mine. All right, so again, the cost for manufacturing zero golf clubs is $19,600. So when you get to question C, that should have been a hint as to how you answered question B. So why do you think there are still costs even if no clubs, zero clubs, are manufactured? So that's just really a, you know, an open-ended question. Why would a company have costs even if they don't make something? So just think about that realistically and just give me a realistic response for question C. There are many possible answers for C. Uh, D, the coordinates of the vertex, and is it a minimum or a maximum? So, so the coordinates, remember, is where you have to do x equals negative b over 2a. You have to get the value for that. And then you have to plug that value back into the function up here uh, for c of x to get the y value. Now, how do you determine if the uh, coordinates there form a minimum or a maximum point? Well, I hope you thought about how the parabola opens. Does this parabola open down or does it open up? So if it opens down, then you would have said a maximum. If it opens up, you should say it's a minimum. All right, and then E, interpret the meaning of the vertex in terms of the number of golf clubs, that's your X value, and the cost, which is your Y value. And also don't forget to include the word minimum or maximum, whichever one you chose. Hopefully you chose the, rope, the, the right one, okay? All right, and in F, you had to find the x-intercepts using the quadratic formula. Uh, if they do not exist, what does this indicate? Uh, and then the hint there, this is where your cost is zero. So um, you should have found that the uh, x-intercepts uh, don't exist, meaning there aren't any. So that's all I'm going to tell you for that problem. I really want you to try to think about what does that indicate uh, for that particular problem. Okay, that there are no x intercepts where the cost is zero. Translate that a little bit into this, this company's problem. All right, so you should have found that there were no x intercepts because you probably had a square root of a negative number, which is undefined. All right, so again, I want you to interpret the meaning of that. If, if they do not exist, what does it indicate for cost and um, the number of uh, manufactured golf clubs? All right, so I already told you that's where the y value or cost is zero. All right, that's the hint that I gave you. Just translate that a little bit more in terms of the company and the manufacturing and the golf clubs, stuff like that. Okay. Okay, let's go to our second application. So I'm going to switch screens here. This is also under the uh, in the document plots for the week two. All right, so this is application number two for plots for week two. Now, this example that we're going to go through, just so you know, this is a very classical example in calculus, uh, but we don't need calculus to solve it. All right, so we're going to do the pre-calculus version for this problem, and then when you get to Calc 1, uh, or maybe in Calc 2, I'm not sure which class it, it is, all right, you're going to see a problem just like this again. So, but you're going to do the calculus version of it when you get the calculus. So let, let's take a look at it. Uh, so we have here, a farmer has 2,000 yards of fence to enclose a rectangular field. What are the dimensions of the length and the width of this rectangle that encloses the most area? <clears throat> All right, so first, a key word here is the word most. And in math, we can actually replace that with the, with the word maximum. Okay, so in mathematics, when we use the word maximum, what are we looking for? All 
So what do you think we would need from a parabola or from a quadratic function to answer the question to figure out this maximum area and the length and the width that will give us the biggest possible area in that fenced off uh, field? So what do we need? We need the vertex. So if you were thinking that, awesome job. So you need the vertex when you're looking for a maximum. Well, where's the equation? <laughs> There's no equation. Well, guess what we, what we have to do? We gotta make it up. All right, so let's sketch this. Let's picture this field here. So we have length and we have width. All right. And what do we want to find the maximum for? Area. All right. So we want the maximum area. So maximum area is desired. So remember that the area of a rectangle is length times width. All right. Now, we don't have enough information at this point to, to go any further. What we have to do next is apply this part of the problem, that there's 2,000 yards of fence to enclose a rectangular field. Well, when you enclose something, you're just going around the, the sides of this area to enclose it. And that's not called area if you're going around the sides. That's called perimeter, all right? So we also know <clears throat> that the perimeter is 2,000 feet of fencing. So our perimeter just means around the edges. How much fencing do you need, okay? So also remember that perimeter <clears throat> is 2 times the length plus 2 times the width. And if that doesn't make sense to you, <clears throat> let me back up. Perimeter is just found by adding up your sides, right? So we have two sides of length and two sides of width. So that expression there just shows that we're adding up all four sides of the rectangle. So even though I left them blank, you have another length on top. So it's length plus length and then the two width sides. So that is 2L plus 2W is equal to 2,000. <clears throat> okay, so what we want to do is focus on this because that's the part we're trying to solve. So what I can do is, step number one, um, we are going to take the perimeter formula, 2,000 equals 2L plus 2W, and we're going to solve for either variable, L or W. And it's your choice here. <clears throat> and I'll show you why that is in just a second. So why don't we first, uh, let, let's solve for L, okay? Let's solve for L. So we would have 2L equals 2,000 minus 2W. Just bring the 2W over to the other side. And next, all we have to do is divide by 2, and we get L equals 1,000 minus 1W. Notice the division works out nicely here. We have 2,000 over 2 is 1,000, and then 2W over 2 is just 1W. <clears throat> Let me give you a minute there to get caught up. All right, so our next step there is going to, we're going to take that expression from part one there, we're going to substitute it into the area formula. Because remember, the area formula is what we're trying to solve because we want the dimensions that give us the most area. So we're solving the area equation. All right, so we have area equals length times width. So area equals, now remember, length is 1,000 minus W. So the L term there, oops, sorry. 
All right, so you see what I did there? I took the L and, and replaced it with 1,000 minus W. And then let's simplify this by distributing. We get 1,000 W minus W squared. <clears throat> now, what kind of an equation is this? This is a quadratic equation now. So now we can use the stuff that we learned about quadratic equations to now find the vertex, which will give us a maximum value. <clears throat> All right, so let's say some things about this quadratic function. All right, so first, our A is like our Y value and W is like our X. So we could write it as y equals 1,000x minus x squared. All right, little a, little b, and c would be negative 1 because it's negative 1w squared, and then 1,000w, and then there's no c term, so c is 0 here. All right, so again, remember, little a is in front of your square term, so that's why it's not 1,000. It's negative 1 for the a value. So what does that mean about this parabola? Since A is negative, it opens down. So I know the vertex has to be the maximum because it's gonna be at the top of that curve. All right, so what I have set up for this problem is a good model, all right? It's a model that will make sense here because it will produce a parabola with a vertex at the top so I know I'm gonna be able to get maximum values. All right. <clears throat> All right, so let's get that vertex. So to get the X value of the vertex, we have to do negative B over 2A. And remember, what's X here really? X is gonna be the width. So that's our width. So that's gonna be the negative of B so negative of 1,000 over 2 times negative 1 is 500, right? Because so that's negative 1,000 divided by negative 2 is positive 500. All right, remember, negative over negative is positive. All right, now to get the y value, and remember the y value here is the area, right? Because I specified that over here. All right, that just comes from this. And then the x values are usually over there. So we're just translating them using different letters. So now we just have to plug in that x value we just found of 500, plug it into the area equation. All right. So that would be uh, 1,000 times w minus um, 500 squared. So our area. This is going to end up being 250,000. All right, what's left? We need the length. So how am I going to find length? Now look on your page. Where is there a formula for length? Right here. All right, length is 1,000 minus the width. So that's 1,000 minus 500 is 500. <clears throat> All right, so in conclusion, The area of the enclosed region will be the greatest when your length and your width are both 500 feet. Right, because they both came out to be the same value, right? 500 and 500, all right? And of course, the area we already found was 250,000. 
All right, but we weren't really asked to find the area, just to lengthen the width, but we have the area there anyhow. So the greatest area will be 250,000 square feet. All right, so I'm gonna give you a minute there to catch up, and then I'm just gonna walk through this problem very briefly one more time, just to make sure you understand the steps now that you've copied everything down. All right, so let's go through this problem one more time very briefly. This way we can understand all the pieces of this puzzle. All right, so, all right, remember, we had 2,000 yards of fencing. So remember, when we talk about fencing, it goes around the outside. And in geometry, we call that the perimeter. So I had to set up a perimeter equation there, uh, which was the 2L plus 2W equals, not P, but it equals 2,000, because we know what the perimeter is. It's 2,000 feet. So you use 2,000 in place of P. But we're not solving for um, perimeter here, all right? So we're solving for uh, the length and the width that give us the most area, the greatest area or the maximum area. So that's why I boxed off at the top here of the script uh, the area equation length times width. That's what we want to solve, <clears throat> all right? And in the very first step that I did, I replaced one of the variables, all right? And the reason why I did that is because we have one equation that we're solving. And in that equation, we have two variables, L and W. So if you don't know this about equations, uh, when you have one equation, you should only have one variable on the right side. So the area equation has length and width, which makes it unsolvable. So that's why in the first step here, um, I took my perimeter equation and I solved for length, um, but also remember I could have solved for width. You could do either or, all right? And then you're gonna substitute that into your area equation, because then we see the area equation, by substituting in that expression, my area equation now has one variable on the right side, which makes it solvable. And especially because it's quadratic. Since we know something about quadratics, we can you know, either use the vertex or the y-intercept or the x-intercept to solve it. But in this problem, we only needed the vertex because we were looking for where the area is the greatest. And the area will be greatest at the top of your parabola, which is your vertex. So then I just found the vertex using just the usual stuff, all right? And I had to remember what do my variables really represent? Well, in the area equation, again, right here, all right, remember the, a, a, the letter A, the capital A is really like Y, and the Ws are like your Xs. So when I find X equals negative B over 2A right here, all right, I'm not really finding X, but X is really the width. So that helps me find the width. Uh, the Y helps me find the area. So in this case, because it's at the vertex, that's the greatest area. So it's not just area, it's the greatest or maximum area. And then finally, I had to find the length because that, we, that was part of the question. So I went back to this equation here that's underlined, right, which came from part one. It's a relationship between length and width, right? A thousand minus the width will give you length. So I just took that and put it down here at the bottom and it also gives me the length. All right, so I hope that makes sense. Okay, so now why don't we now, I'm going to switch my page here. We're going to continue here with notes, and we're going to switch gears a little bit. Okay, so 
in my script here for notes for today, uh, we just completed number one in plots for the week. All right, so I'll upload those also later tonight when class is done. This way you can see what I wrote on those particular pages. So number two, all right, we're gonna continue looking at other, I'm gonna put that in quotes, other degree two um, problems. And these are gonna be degree two, but they're gonna be non-quadratic. That might not make any sense because we talked about that if something is degree two, it's quadratic, all right? So it's non-quadratic when you have multiple, so equations with multiple degree two terms are non-quadratic. I'll give you two examples. So first, example one, if we have f of x equals x squared plus 2x plus 1. <clears throat> this is quadratic because it has a single x squared term. But if I have another squared term in there with a different variable, so if I have uh, f of, uh, let's say, x and w, if I have x squared plus w squared plus some other stuff, whatever, let's say we have a 2x and a minus 3w and a minus 4, we'll make it interesting. The problem is that we have two squared variables, and that becomes degree 2, but non-quadratic. So that just means that the graph of this is not a parabola. All right, the graph of this is not a parabola. So this is non-quadratic because it has multiple squared terms. Okay, but that's what we're gonna be looking at this evening. And in particular, we're gonna be looking at um, uh, familiar shapes that uh, you probably have learned in geometry, all right? So our other degree problems, so we're going to be focusing on, so let's call this part here A. B, so B is really going to be our focus for the rest of the night, and it's these geometric shapes called conic sections. All right, so conic sections are sections of cones. So conic means cone. <clears throat> okay, so, <clears throat> so here's what a conic section looks like. All right, so I'm going to try and be fancy with my sketching here. So we have two lines crisscrossing, and I'm going to make this three-dimensional. I'm going to put a circle at the top, circle at the bottom, just to give it a three-dimensional look. So it looks like two ice cream cones pointing at each other. So think of it like that. So it's like we're looking at two ice cream cones pointing at each other uh, or connected there at that little intersection in the middle. <clears throat> Now, a conic section is a slice of that. So like, for example, if I were to slice the cone at the top here, if I go straight across, this slice right here, all right, as long as it's parallel to the top, all right, this slice is a circle. So you can kind of see that the way I traced it, it looks circular. So a circle is a special type of conic section. Now there's different ways that you can slice those cones. And I'm gonna show you an actual picture of it because I can't draw very well. So 
Um, let me show you a picture of the other conic sections. All right, and you'll see that there's four types of conic sections. Circles are one type. All right, here it is. Let me zoom in a little bit for you. All right, so we just looked at the one here where you have uh, the second one here is the circle. If you, if you slice straight across, you get a circle. Now, if you look at the first one, the first one should look familiar. If you slice a cone on an angle, such as what you see there, it will actually trace a parabola uh, on the bottom cone. And you can see that in yellow, that you have a parabola being traced there by the slice of the bottom cone. Again, the second one, if you slice straight across, you get a circle. If you slice on an angle in the third diagram, you also get something circular, but it's elongated, and that's called an ellipse, okay? And if you don't know this, the planets actually travel around the sun uh, in the shape of an ellipse. Uh, the planets don't go around in a perfect circle around the sun. They actually travel in a more stretched circle, which we call an ellipse. It's kind of like an egg-shaped circle. It's stretched out a little bit. All right, and then the fourth diagram that you see there, if you slice the, uh, the cones vertically like that, notice it will actually hit the cones twice, and you get two parabolas. But the parabolas, they go in opposite directions, and we call that a hyperbola. All right, or hyperbola. Some people say hyperbola, some say hyperbola. I say hyperbola, whatever. Okay, so those are the four types of conic sections, which are just found by slicing the cones uh, at different angles. And it produces different traces or slices, whatever you want to call them, okay? All right, so let me go back to my notes. All right, and now let's outline them here without really drawing anything with the codes. So we have the first type, which we're already familiar with, is the parabola. And since we just did this, we're not going to do anything new with that. Uh, the second is the circle, which I think we all know what a circle looks like, right? Nice and round. The third is also like a circle but it's more stretched or elongated, right? And also a circle is a type of ellipse. I'm not sure if you knew that. Circles are a special type of ellipse, and I'll explain that when we go through ellipses. All right, and then the hyperbola. Again, think of this as like a double parabola, where you have a parabola opening up, and down, and they actually have asymptotes. They have uh, slanted asymptotes that separate them, and the asymptotes will actually intersect right in the center of that space in between the hyperbolas. All right, so let's start with circles. Oops, what did I just do there? There we go. All right, so first, let's define the equation of a circle. That's what we're really interested in here with uh, these shapes. Are there equations, right? So definition. The equation of a circle centered at, remember every circle has a center, right? So the center will be um, an x and y value uh, or a point on a graph. So centered at h and k. So h would be the x coordinate of the center and k is the y coordinate of the center. So the equation of a circle centered at h comma k with radius r in standard form is given by. 
So we have x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals radius squared. <clears throat> All right, and what you need are values for r, h, and k. So you need three numbers to make an equation of a circle. All right, you need three numbers to write the equation of a circle. Okay, now we can see how we have how many square terms, right? It looks like we have three square terms, but really it's the first two square terms with variables, right? We have an x squared and a y squared in the first two terms. So it's non-quadratic, but it's still degree two, all right? It's still degree two. All right, let's do some examples here. So let's write uh, equations for each circle. All right, so let's say we knew that our circle had a center at zero, zero, and the radius was two, all right? Um, so let's first write the equation for this, all right? So you'd have to do x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals radius squared, all right? So now since the center is given, which it needs to be given, we know that h and k are zero and zero. So then I would write, All right, x minus 0 squared plus y minus 0 squared equals 2 squared, right, radius squared. <clears throat> and now simplify just a tad. x minus 0 is x, so that's x squared. y minus 0 is y, so the next term is y squared. And of course, 2 squared is simple enough, is 4. Okay. And there you go, that's it. You fill in the values and you simplify uh, just a little bit where necessary. <clears throat> All right, let's try another one where the center is at negative one and three and the radius is 10. Okay, so now if we do the same thing again, x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals radius squared. Okay, we fill in h and k, all right? So those are negative one and three. So that would go here and there. And then we bring down the rest. So it's x minus negative 1 squared plus y minus 3 squared equals 10 squared. And then we only have to simplify the uh, signs. So we get x plus 1 squared plus y minus 3 squared equals 100. <clears throat> Okay, so there's that. All right, so in the second problem here, there's no need to simplify the rest. So do not simplify further. For standard form, you don't have to simplify any further, right? And that means you don't have to square x plus 1. You don't have to square y minus 3 doing all that fancy algebra, all right? So just leave them just like that, and it looks nice and pretty. 
So now what you're going to do for your second group work for 10 minutes only, all right, you will do problems uh, two and three, which are very similar to problems one and two that you see right here. So you'll do problems two and three only for 10 minutes. <clears throat> right, so I'm just giving everybody another minute there to catch up on copying down anything on the screen there. And then I'm going to uh, unshare the screen and then I'll put you into groups for just 10 minutes. Okay, so um, did I answer your question, Abdullah? You asked a question in the chat there. I, I hope what I just said there about simplifying answers that question there. Awesome, good, good, good. All right, folks, I'm gonna put you into the groups now just for the 10 minutes. Let me set the time. Okay, here you go. I'll see you in 10 minutes. All right, so let me share my notes again. Here we go. All right, so let's finish off here our topic of circles, and then we're going to move on to the other shapes. Um, so we just looked at what's called the standard form of the equation of a circle, where it's defined by its radius and its center point. Okay, and it's and it's not simplified either. Right, we just fill in the numbers and we stop. So those should have been pretty easy. Like like a number two here, we didn't simplify that any further um, at all. So what we're going to do next is actually simplify further into what's called the general form of circle equations. So first, the general form is AX squared plus BY squared plus CX plus DY plus E equals zero, where capital A and capital B will be the same number. Um, and also, those are the numbers that are attached to your squared terms, your x squared and your y squared. So that means those particular numbers are important because they're attached to the terms with the highest exponents. So, right? so they have some kind of power um, or weight over all the other terms. So A and B are more important than C, D, and E in that equation, because they're attached to the squared terms, which have the highest power, all right? All right, so for example, let's take uh, the problem from above. So our answer from that was x plus one squared plus y minus three squared equals 100. And now to write this in general form, you just simplify it, all right? So now you're actually gonna continue with the problem um, and just simplify it as much as you can, all right, by combining like terms and stuff like that, okay? So you just simplify to write in general form. 
All right, so x plus one squared is x plus one times x plus one, plus y minus three squared is y minus three times y minus three is equal to 100. So I have to do FOIL not once, but I have to do FOIL twice, all right? So from this expression here, we get x squared plus 2x plus 1. And from that expression there, we get y squared minus 6x plus 9 equals 100. All right, so again, what I just did there was used FOIL. All right, and I just simplified it all at once instead of writing all the terms out and then simplifying it. Okay, and now what I'm going to do is rearrange the terms, all right, so that they're in the order that you see in the, um, the general form. So notice the first term in the box is the x squared. The second term is the y squared. The third term is x. The fourth term is y. And the last term should be a number. So what you do next is just rearrange the terms. So you put your x squared term first, then your y squared term, then your x term, and your y term. And whoops, that's not an x. That's a y there next to the 6. All right, then there's a minus 6y plus 1 plus 9. Minus 100 equals zero. All right, I guess I could have added those numbers all at once. Now I have to rewrite all this stuff. So what do you get when you add up the numbers? We get minus 90. All right, so where my capital A is 1, my capital B is 1, my capital C is the 2, my capital D is negative six, and that capital E is minus 90. All right, so you put every term and every number on the left side of the equation and zero on the other side, and you put the terms in this particular order, x squared, y squared, x, y, and a number. All right, so all together you'll have five terms going right across. All right, and also notice, all right, this satisfies that A equals B, one and one. Okay. All right, let's do another example, but this time let's do it the other way. So we're gonna write uh, X squared plus Y squared plus 8x minus 4y plus 1 equals 0 in standard form. Okay, so what is this expression here? This is general form. So we are gonna convert from general form to standard form. All right, so now how are we gonna do this? First, we're gonna rearrange the terms to like undo the terms. So what we're gonna do is we're going to put the x terms together, the y terms together, and then we're going to put that 1 on the other side. So what we're going to have to do to do this is we're going to have to complete the square. So it's back. All right, and that's why I moved that one over to the other side. All right, so remember you move the constant term to the other side. And then for completing the square, all right, we're actually gonna have to complete the square for X and we're gonna have to complete the square for Y. 
So it's like a double completing the square problem. So let's do the x term. So remember, what do we do when we complete the square? We take our b value, which in this case is 8. We divide it by 2, we get 4. And then we square it, giving us 16. So then what that means is we add, remember, 16 to the equation. So we end up getting uh, x squared plus 8x plus 16 equals negative 1 plus 16. Remember, you got to balance the equation and add it to both sides. All right, let's just do one more step with the blue stuff, and then we'll go back and do the red stuff. So now remember that this will factor into a perfect square of x plus 4. So remember that this number up here that I just boxed off is the number that will go in the factoring. All right, so we get negative 1 plus 16. We will add those up, but, but we have one more step to do, all right, and then we'll add everything. So let's go back now and do the red stuff. So remember, that's a negative 4. We have to divide it by 2, and it gives you negative 2. Then you square it, and it gives you 4. Now we're going to add that to the equation also. So we're going to add it to this side. And we're going to add it to this side as well. All right, along with the y squared and the minus 4y. All right, now we add this factorization to the first factorization. This will be y minus 2. All right, remember, it's minus 2, because remember, after you divide by 2 there in that first step, that number will always be with the, the variable in the factorization. <clears throat> All right, so now you simplify just a little bit more, and we end up with x plus 4 squared, y minus 2 squared equals 19 when you add those numbers up. Okay, and that's the standard form. Okay, that is the standard form. So remember, standard form is x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals radius squared. So we have an equation that looks like that form there. So what we could say is that this circle has a center at negative 4 comma 2, <clears throat> and the radius is the square root of 19. <clears throat> All right, not 19, but the square root of 19, because remember, your radius is squared. Okay, so think about that. So when you do radius squared, that's going to be the square root of 19 squared is exactly 19 which is what you see over here in this equation. All right, so that's why the radius isn't 19, it's the square root of 19. <clears throat> okay, so that's it with circles. Let's go on to now the next uh, type of conic section called ellipse, or ellipses. All right, so remember, these are elongated circles. <clears throat> now, here's the difference between um, uh, an ellipse and a circle. So with a circle, right, if I go from my center, so let's say if I look at the radius going across, and the radius going up, those are equal. Those are equal, 
all right? So the radius, in other words, is constant. Whereas with an ellipse, it's not constant. All right, so if we find the center of this. All right, if we compare the, the one radius with the other radius, one's longer than the other. So let's call this one A and that one B. All right, and A is what we call the major radius. And B is what we call the minor radius. Major meaning bigger, minor meaning smaller, okay? And we do use those letters for major and minor. So little a is major radius, little b is minor radius. All right, so now here's the standard form. It's very similar to a circle. So the standard form of the equation for an ellipse. All right, so first it will have center HK and of course A, which is the major radius, and B, the minor radius. <clears throat> All right, now there's actually two forms that we use. All right, and I'll explain them. So the first form is written like this. It's x minus h squared divided by a squared plus y minus k squared divided by b squared equals one. All right, and you use this one when the major radius, which is A, is parallel to the x-axis. So in other words, it will look something like this. All right. So you can see that that ellipse that I just drew there is it, it's, its major radius is stretching across, not up, right? So if the center is, I don't know, about here, we can see that it has a major radius that goes across and it's parallel to the x-axis, meaning it goes in the same direction, all right? So that would be my A there. And also notice in the equation, look at how A lines up with x, not y, all right? So in the equation, little a is under x. So that's an indication how you know that it's going to be positioned horizontally. Whereas, let's say the, the ellipse is flipped around the other way. What if it's going up and down? So then the equation would change to this. It'd be x minus h squared over b squared. b is the minor radius plus y minus k squared over a squared, the major radius, equals 1. Okay, so we use the second one when the major radius, which is A, is parallel to the y-axis. So it'll look something like this. It'll be stretched in the vertical direction. Okay, so then your major radius right here all right you can see that it's parallel to the y-axis it's actually right on top of the y-axis all right so that would be your major radius going up and down parallel to the y-axis all right 
And the center here looks like probably the origin. All right, so I'll give you a minute there to copy if you're still writing things down. And then I'm going to switch to the other document with the uh, plots for the week. So I have pictures of ellipses that we're going to write the equations of. Uh, one other thing I just want to note here in the second equation, also note um, that the major radius A is under the Y term, right? So you use that when the Y axis is parallel to that major axis. So A will always line up with the axis or variable that it's parallel to. So in the first equation, A lines up with X when it's parallel to the X axis. And in the second equation, A lines up with Y when it's parallel to the Y axis. All right, so let's do uh, the examples there on the plots for the week. All right, so here we're going to write the equations. Okay, so in the first example, all right, so you can see here, I'm going to highlight uh, the major radius and the minor radius. So it looks like our center here is zero, zero, all right? So let's write that down. The center is zero, zero. And therefore we have the minor radius would be that little symbol there, all right? So that minor radius has a length of two. And then we have the major radius, which goes across, that looks like it's four units. So now I have everything that I need. The center, remember, is HK. And I have the minor and major radii of two and four. All right, and this, um, the major radius, right? So we would say that A is parallel to the X axis. All right, remember, you have to look at the major radius. It's parallel to the X axis. So therefore, our equation, our initial equation would be x minus h squared over a squared. So the a term goes under x because the radius a, the major radius, is parallel to the x-axis, all right? So I'm using the first form of the equations. All right, so now substituting in, we have x minus 0 squared over a squared, so 4 squared, plus y minus 0 squared over 2 squared, right, the minor radius, is 1. All right, and what we're going to do is just simplify just a touch more, and that will give us x squared over 16 plus y squared over 4 equals 1. All right, and that would be the standard form for the equation of this ellipse. Now, the second example, all right, is pretty much the same exact ellipse as the first one, but it's, it's rotated the other way, all right? So this time, the major radius lines up with the y-axis. So this time our A is still four, the bigger number is always A. Two is our B, but this time A is parallel to the Y axis. So then therefore, 
the equation would be x minus h squared over b squared. Because you notice that the minor radius is with the x-axis, but the major radius, a, lines up with the y-axis. So we need the, the equation where the a is underneath the uh, y-axis, because a is parallel to the y-axis. But also look at b. b is parallel to the x-axis. You could think of it like that also. Works the same way. So we get x minus 0 squared over 2 squared plus y minus 0 squared over 4 squared equals 1. So that just gives us x squared over 4 plus y squared over 16 equals 1. Now you see here, when you compare the two answers, the only difference is, is that the 4 and the 16 switch places. That's it. So when you have two graphs that really are the same ellipse, but one's rotated the other way, the denominators will switch because you have to switch the major and the minor radius to line up with the proper axis. Okay. All right, so we have two more to do here on this slide. All right, so in our third example, all right, here's the center already given, negative 1, 1. So remember, that's H and K, H and K. All right, now we have our major radius and our minor radius. So this major radius looks like it's two units, and the minor looks like it's one unit. All right, and what is A parallel to? The x-axis. So then that means A will be under x. All right, so I'll be using this equation. I'll be using x minus h squared over A squared because A is parallel to the x-axis, plus y minus k squared over uh, b squared equals 1. <clears throat> All right, now fill in A and B and fill in H and K. So we get x minus negative 1 squared over 2 squared, plus y minus k is 1. So y minus 1 squared over 1 squared equals 1. All right, and now just simplify a touch. Uh, we get x plus 1 squared over 4 plus y minus 1 squared equals 1. All right. Notice that the middle term here does not have a denominator because what's the denominator? It's one. So it's kind of like, you know, with whole numbers, when you have three over one, it's just three. So when you have y minus one squared over one, it's just y minus one squared, all right? So remember that if it doesn't have a denominator, it really has a denominator of one. All right, let's do the fourth one. All right, so now this one here doesn't tell you anything other than just the picture. So you find your best center right there. So can you see the coordinates of the center? Looks like it's over 1 and down 5. So 1 comma negative 5 looks like our center. And then from the center, measure the two radii, all right? So we would have this radius here and that radius there. So it looks like we have a radius of 2 and a radius of 3. All right, so that means our A would be 3. Our A is always the larger of the 2. And then 2 would be B. All right, and then also we want to note that A is parallel to the x-axis. OK. So once again, we use x minus h squared over a squared. 
All right, so we put A under the X term because A is parallel to the X axis. So A and X should line up. All right, and then we just fill in the rest. All right, so remember the center is H and K. So that means our H is one and our K is negative five. So I get X minus one squared over three squared plus y minus negative five squared over two squared equals one. All right, and now we simplify a little bit like the squared numbers. I get nine here. I get y plus five squared there over four equals one. All right, and there's my equation of that ellipse. <clears throat> okay, so let me give you a minute there if you're copying down anything there. I'll let you catch up. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my notes. And what we're going to look at now, all right, so we just looked at the standard form of an ellipse. So let's now do the general form of an ellipse. All right, so first, the general form of an ellipse looks exactly the same as the general form of, of a circle. So you're going to have AX plus BY oh, squared squared, excuse me, AX squared plus BY squared plus CX plus DY plus E equals zero. So here it's the same exact form as a circle, but this time A won't equal B. A and B will be different, and that's a reflection of the fact that you have two different radius values. You have a major radius and a minor radius, and they're different, all right? So when your major radius and your minor radius are equal, that's when you get a circle, all right? So when your major and minor radii are the same number, that's when you get a circle. So a circle is a special type of ellipse where the major and minor radius is just the radius of the circle because they're equal. Okay, so there's the general form of an ellipse. All right, so for example, number one, all right, let's say we want to take the equation 4x squared plus 9y squared minus 8x plus 18y minus 2 equals 0. So you see it lines up nicely with the A, B, C, D, and E terms, all right? So first thing we could say is that this is an ellipse. Since, well, all you have to look at are A and B, right? A and B are not the same, right? They're what, four and nine? So therefore, this is going to be an ellipse. So then what you can do is, just like with the circle, is complete the square to rewrite this in standard form. So standard form is what we just did with the graphs. 
all right, where you don't simplify the squared parts, all right, you just leave it the way it is. Okay, so what you're going to have to do is, is rearrange the terms, put the x's with the x's, so 4x squared minus 8x, put the y terms together, so 9y squared and plus 18y, and let's throw the 2 to the other side. All right, now this problem is going to involve a little bit more work because remember the, the square terms, all right, remember the one rule about completing the square is that you need to have a one in front of your x squared term and a one in front of the y squared term. But now here's the problem with this equation. We have two numbers here. So yesterday, uh, when we had one variable, it was simply okay to divide the entire equation by the number, all right? But here we have two numbers. So if you divide by four and nine, that's gonna be a little bit of a problem, all right? It's not gonna work the way you want. So what you're actually gonna do is actually just factor four out of those terms right there. You can start by doing that. So if you factor four out of those terms, you get x squared minus 2x. And now notice inside, we have an x squared with a one in front, right? It's a one x squared and a minus 2x. And then here, we'll factor out a nine. So we want to get rid of the nine. And that gives us y squared plus 2y equals two. Okay? All right, now we're going to complete the square inside the parentheses. So we're going to have four times x squared minus 2x plus, now what are we going to add in there? So remember, what you have to do is you have to take the number in front of the x, which is negative 2, divide it by 2, you get negative 1, square that, you get positive 1. <clears throat> and then we add that into here. Okay, now, on the other side of the equation, in a problem like this, it's actually wrong to add one to the other side. Because take a look, we're adding one inside the parentheses, but what would you do to simplify the parentheses? You'd have to times it by four. So we're adding one inside the parentheses, which is multiplied by four. So we're really adding four to this side of the equation, all right, because it's four times one. So over here, we're going to add 4, not 1. <clears throat> All right, let me take this a step further. Next, this would factor into x minus 1 squared. All right, so now we're leaving some room for the next part with the y terms. So we're going to have plus 9 times y squared plus 2y plus 1. All right, so where am I getting that from? The two here. So you'd have to take the two, divide it by two, you get one. Next, you square it, you get one again, and it gets added here. All right, now, what am I really adding to this equation? I'm adding one inside of a parentheses, which is being multiplied by nine. So when I go to simplify this, I'm really adding nine here. So that means over here, we're also going to add 9. <clears throat> okay. So that gives me plus 9 times x plus 1 squared. All right, now we're almost done. We're almost done. All right, so what you want to do next is, well, of course, add this up. We get 15. All 
All right, bring down the rest. All right, and now what we want to do is get rid of the four and the nine. All right, so now four times nine is 36. So what you're going to do there is divide the equation by 36. All right, so that gives us x minus 1 squared over 9 because 4 over 36, right, would reduce to 1 and 9. So we get a 9 under here. <clears throat> All right, and then uh, same thing here, 9 over 36 would become x plus 1 squared over 4 equals 15 over 36. Okay. All right, so last and final step is we need a one here. All right, so what you would have to do is now to make that a one, you would have to divide the equation and fix that up. So you divide the equation by 15 over 36. All right, now that's not gonna be a pretty solution, all right? So why don't we leave that there, all right? Um, and then we'll just try our best here to divide by 15 over 36, all right? So when you divide by 15, 36, you can also multiply by 36 over 15, <clears throat> okay? So then we could do that, 36 over 15 times x minus 1 squared over 9 plus 36 over 15 times x plus 1 squared over 4 equals 15 over 36 times 36 over 15. Now the right side is definitely 1, right, because the 15s cancel and the 36s cancel. I'm sorry, I wish that were a nicer number, but it's not. All right. Uh, so now we get, uh, so let's do some cancellations. Like 9 and 36, we get 4. 4 and 36, we get 9. So what we have here is x minus 1 squared. Now also remember what we have here, we have four fifteenths being multiplied to that, but also remember we, we want the number to be underneath of the squared expression. So instead of timesing by four fifteenths, we can divide by 15 fourths. Same thing with the uh, next term, we have nine fifteenths being multiplied. So what we can do is instead of multiplying by nine fifteenths, we, we divide by 15 ninths. All right, and there's that example. Let me give you a minute there to catch up, and we'll do one more that will actually be a lot easier than what we just did here. So I'd like to do one more where the numbers are a lot more friendly. So finish copying, and then we'll do the next example.
Oops, sorry. There we go. All right, example number two, I promise this will be a lot easier. It'll be a lot nicer. And the one on your lab should be very nice also. So we have this in general form, right? Because it's got the five terms. So now the first thing we do is rearrange it with X terms together, the two Y terms together. And let's move that four over to the other side. All right, so now let's complete the square here. So remember the first term here has to be a one. So the X squared term needs to have a one there. So what we're gonna do is factor it out. And that will give us X squared minus two X. Now I'm gonna leave a space there because we're gonna complete the square right in this step. Now the Y squared term already has a one in front of it. So I don't have to do any fancy factoring. Okay, so now with the X terms, let's take the negative two there in front of the X. And remember what we do, we divide it by two, which gives me negative one. Square it, we get positive one. Now we add it back in. And that's inside of a parentheses that's being multiplied by four, right? So we're not adding one to the right side, we're adding four to the right side, right? Because again, this one here is multiplied by four. So we're really adding four to the whole equation. So we've got to add four to that side. All right, and then let's complete the square for the middle uh, of the Y term. So there's a four there. You divide it by two, you get two. Square it, you get four. Add it back into the equation. But here, since we added four here, all right, there's no number in front of it. So we're just adding four all together, which means over here, I add in another four. In fact, let me use different colors. So this would be a red four and a red four. Okay, that's why you can distinguish them. All right, now let's do the factoring. So here we get four times X minus one squared plus y plus two squared. So again, remember the numbers inside the parentheses are the numbers that you get from dividing here. So x minus one and y plus two, because it's a positive two, equals four. Okay? Because all this adds up to four, right? Zero plus four. All right, next, right here, we need a one. So what we could do is, is just divide the equation by four because four divided by four will give me one. So I divide that by four also. All right, and then this simplifies very nicely. We get exactly one. Uh, for the X minus one square term, what do we get there? Notice it's going to be four over four. So that's going to be over one. Whereas this term here, you get y plus two squared over four. And there you go. So this would be an ellipse with the center at one comma negative two. All right, this is uh, we have an A value of two for the major axis, since two squared is the four that you see there. And the minor radius is one, since one squared is one. And that's coming from over here under the X, 
where you don't really need a one. All right. And this ellipse is parallel to the y axis. Since the major axis lines up with y in the equation. All right, now in just a minute, it's gonna be time for group work number three, where you're gonna do the ellipse problems. Right, which is numbers four and five. All right, let's say we do that for 10 minutes. And actually, let's make it 15. This way we can have a little bit of a break also if you need to. All right, so we'll do 15 minutes, numbers four and five. Okay, and just a little, little bit of instruction here. All right, so the graphs that you see here, all right, uh, I tell you what the centers are. I just want you to write the equation of each ellipse that is shown there. And just do it the same way that I did it with my graphs, where you just set it up and then just move on. You don't need to simplify it like crazy, all right? So just set it up and move on. But number five, number five, you'll, you're gonna have to complete the square of this, okay? And then you'll have to tell me the center, the major and minor radii, um, and also sketch the ellipse, okay? You'll have to sketch the ellipse. All right, so before we do that, why don't we sketch the ellipse for this problem here, since I didn't do that for you. All right, so first you wanna plot the center, which is at one, negative two. All right, and now remember the major axis is parallel to the Y axis. So that would have a length of two, not four. Remember, it's, it's the square of two. So two is your major radius. So that means you would go from this point here, you would go up two, and you would go down two. All right, and then the minor radius, remember, is one. So from the center, you would go out one. Out one there and out one there. And just draw your ellipse around those four points. All right. So I hope you see that you have your major radius of two units here, right from the center to the top or the center to the bottom. And then if you go across, you're only going across one to the edges of the ellipse there because the minor radius is one. All right, and then you just connect those four points and it forms um, an ellipse parallel to the y-axis. All right, just uh, 30 seconds more, and then I will put you in groups. So if you're still writing, right, or if you're looking at the lab, all right, you can work on it. You don't have to wait. Okay, so let me set up the, uh, the groups. All right, remember, you have 15 minutes. All right, so make sure you work in a little break also so you can stretch, get something to drink, uh, use the restroom, all right? Stand up and stretch at least so you don't get any blood clots in your legs. Okay. All right, I'll see you in 15 minutes. And I'll share my screen with you.
Okay, so. There we go. Okay, so, so on the screen there should be my notes. And our last uh, shape and equation that we're going to take a look at are hyperbolas. So for hyperbolas, uh, either form two parabolas that open in opposite directions. So either they go vertically or they go horizontally. All right, so that's what we're going to be uh, plotting and writing equations for. All right, so first thing we're going to do, we're actually going to start with the general form, because we're not going to do a whole lot with it, but just define it. So the general form of equations of hyperbolas. All right, so the general form is going to look something like this. You're going to have AX squared minus BY squared, so plus CX plus DX plus, sorry, DY plus E equals zero. Now, do you notice something here about this versus the A, B, C, D, E form of ellipses and circles? The first two terms were both positive in ellipses and in circles. We had AX squared plus BY squared. So this is the key right here, is that there's a minus sign instead of a plus sign this time. All right, and that's how you know the equation is a hyperbola, okay? Also, you can have the case where either A equals B or not. So it doesn't matter if A and B are equal for a hyperbola. That makes no difference. The most important difference is this first one is that you have a minus sign in between the first two squared terms, okay? All right, so for example, all right, so let's say we have 4x squared minus 3y squared plus 2x minus y plus 4 equals 0. And then let's say I have 4x squared plus 3y squared plus 2x minus y plus 4 equals 0. And then let's say I have 4x squared plus 4y squared plus 2x minus y plus 4 equals 0. <clears throat> so the question here is, which of these equations is for a hyperbola, which is for an ellipse, and which is for a circle? All right, and you can only use one of those answers, you know, once. There's no repeated answers. And remember that the general form really just depends on the first two terms. So that's why you notice like these last three terms are exactly the same. They're not important. So I could put a million things here and it doesn't matter what these three terms are. What matters are the first two terms, okay? So now notice that there's a big difference between one and the last two, the minus sign and the plus signs. So because this has a minus sign, this would be a hyperbola. All right, so that's the distinguishing feature there. So now we narrow down the last two. One of those is an ellipse and one of those is a circle. So you have to remember something about A and B. So in the equation two here, a and B are different values. So that means we have an ellipse. So you would just tell me that A is not the same as B, so therefore you're going to get an ellipse. So remember, those A and B values are going to correspond 
all right, directly to your major and minor axes. So if there are different values, then the, the radii are going to be different. Whereas in the last equation, these two numbers here are equal. So you're going to get equal uh, radii. All right, and what shape has equal radii? It's a circle. And your explanation, your reason would be that A equals B. And of course, with the first one, the minus sign of the y squared term right, is an indicator that we have a hyperbola. Okay, so that, that's the big difference between the three types. All right, so next we're going to look at the standard form of the equations of hyperbolas. And our standard form really involves center, right? And then uh, certain numbers that kind of indicate where everything goes. So let me give you a minute there to catch up. Okay, so the standard form of the equations of hyperbolas. All right, now, just like ellipses, there's going to be two types, um, because remember up here with this drawing that I made, um, if the hyperbola is open in the upward direction, uh, it's going to take on one type of equation. But if they open in the horizontal direction, then the equation kind of changes around a little bit, just like the way the ellipse did. So number one, so if you have... So first, here are the features. Okay. Um, oh, also, one thing I didn't mention is that for, for this, we're going to focus on hyperbolas that are centered at the origin. So let's add that to our title. Centered at 0, 0. Okay. So we're not going to look at any other centers. So that means our h and our k are going to be zero here. So we're not going to need H and K values for these. All right, so first, now, let's look at the features of the graph so we can understand them in the equation. All right, so let's say, all right, if you're centered at the origin, then you're going to have, if you, let's say, for example, your hyperbola opens in the horizontal direction. All right, so the first thing we would say is that the graph opens along the x-axis. So the x-axis is called the transverse axis. That's a special name we give it. You could also think of the transverse axis as a line of symmetry. So it looks like the x axis here would be our line of symmetry. So we say then that the graph opens along that axis, and it's called the transverse axis. All right, so then at those two points on the graph, we're going to have A and negative A, because it's just a reflection to the left and it's negative. So we would say that the vertices. Vertices are just important points, all right? Vertices are important points. And they would be at negative a comma zero and a comma zero. 
Okay. And now there's also, also on the y axis, we would have <clears throat> two other points at B and negative B. All right. So similar to an ellipse, you're going to have little a and little b. With an ellipse, a and b were the radii. All right. But here, uh, we're going to have something different for um, hyperbolas. Now, what you can do is with these four numbers at a, b, negative a, and negative b, you can form a rectangle that just goes straight across and up and down through those four values. And then at the corners of those, you're going to have asymptotes, slanted asymptotes, that will bound the curves. Okay, so you will have slanted asymptotes. All right, with equations, y equals <clears throat> plus or minus b over ax. So it has slope b over a, plus or minus. Oh, I forgot an equal sign there. Sorry, it's y equals, y equals. All right, and then the standard form of the whole thing is, so you have x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared equals one. So just like in the, the general form up above in number one, you, you're going to have another minus sign in between the two terms. And also notice that the vertices at A are on the x-axis. So notice where A is placed in the equation. It's under x, not y. OK? And also notice that the, the, the transverse term, the x term, is positive. All right? Notice that it's positive. All right, so let's do an example of this version before I give you the part two. So let's say we have the equation x squared over 4 minus y squared over 9 equals 1. So you could also think of this as x squared over 2 squared minus y squared over 3 squared equals 1. So that tells you that A is 2 and B is 3. <clears throat> so now if we were to set up a graph, just like the one that you see here on the screen, all you would need to do is just be a little more precise. Right? So you would have A, remember, lines up with X, right? So therefore, you'd have to go out two units on the A axis because A is 2. So you'd have a 2 and negative 2, your vertices. All right, and then on the Y axis, you would go out 3 and down negative 3. And remember that little imaginary box? is formed by those four points. I'm going to draw the curves first. So remember, the curves would go out along the x-axis. All right. And notice the curves don't go inside the box. All right. They do not go inside the box. And then you draw the asymptotes through the corners there. 
Although, the asymptotes are supposed to line up with the curves. And you get something like that. Okay. Oh, I missed the corner. Big deal. All right. But that's the idea. I noticed that those curves would eventually stretch along the asymptotes. So, you know, what I really should do then is make sure that this curve uh, make sure this curve actually goes more towards the lines like that. So that looks a little better that way. Oops, I lost my x-axis. There we go. Okay. All right, now. Let's look at it the other way. What if the curve opens up and down? All right. So then if the curve opens up and down, all right, this time you're going to have, <coughs> excuse me, and you're going to have your A and your negative A here. and the curves will open out, I'm sorry, open up, open down. Notice how this time the A switched. The A on the last problem was on the X axis when the curves open along the X axis. Now it's gonna open along the Y axis. So the A values will be on the Y axis. So let's first just make that note right there. So here, these curves, open along the y-axis. So that means the y-axis is the transverse. All right, and then the, the y-intercepts are at zero A and zero negative A. All right, are the vertices. All right, and then along the x-axis somewhere, I'm not sure where, but you'll have the B values, which are not on the curve, but they're gonna help us form that box for the uh, asymptotes. So again, notice how the curves, they don't go through the box, all right? The asymptotes will go through the box. Sort of like that. All right, well then we say the asymptotes, the slanted asymptotes, have equations y equals plus or minus and this time it's a over b because the y values are the a values right so it's rise over run so the rise would be up a and over b would be the slope of those lines times x all right and finally the standard form that we're going to use is y squared over a squared minus x squared over b squared equals one. All right, notice how everything switched around. This time the y term is first and it's positive because we're using the y axis as the transverse axis. So the y term here gets the positive and x isn't being used. So that would be the term with the minus sign, all right? And again, the A's and B's that you see here, remember, are squared numbers. And they're the numbers that would fit right here on the X and Y axes, okay? So the term that's positive will always tell you what the transverse axis is. 
So since the first term here is a positive y term, not a negative, uh, then that means this curve opens up along the y-axis. For example, say we have y squared over 16 minus x squared over 25 equals 1. All right, so notice it looks just like the equation there in the box. Y squared's first and it's positive. So we know that this is going to open in the y direction. So let's first rewrite this as y squared over 4 squared minus x squared over 5 squared is 1. So that tells us that the a value is 4, the b value is 5, right? So the vertices will be on the y-axis, all right? Because remember, the a value lines up with the y, with the variable y. All right, so now let's try to carefully sketch this. So on the y-axis, we're going to go up 4, down 4, and there's my a values. And then the B values are 5 on the X axis. All right. And remember, we can make a box out of that. So draw the box. All right. And remember, our curves will not go through that box. Remember, the curves will open out along the Y axis. All right. And then also the asymptotes it might be easier to draw the asymptotes first. This way we can make sure that the curves line up with these things. You might have to stretch these out a little bit to make sure that when you draw the curves, the curves start lining up with those slants. OK, with those slanted asymptotes. So the first one would start here and work its way over. This one also, work its way over. And then this one would start at the very bottom of the box and open out along the y-axis. So it's going to open down. So it's like you have two parabolas opening up and down. And then they stretch out to the slanted asymptotes and just kind of go in those opposite directions. All right, so hopefully that is simple. All right, we have two more examples to do, and they're going to be on the um, plots for the week handout. But I will give you a minute there to finish copying this down. Okay, so now let's take a look at the last two examples in the handout, where uh, this is the last page of the handout. We want to write the equation of the graph. So now we're going to do the opposite. Okay, so what we can see first in this plot is that the, the curves open up and down. So that means the y-axis is the transverse. All right, so that means all right, we're going to have an equation that looks like this. All right, so if your y-axis is the transverse, then your, your y-squared term should be first and positive. Now all you got to do is figure out a and b. And remember, the box gives that away. So remember here in the box, your A's would be right there, all right, on the y-axis. Because remember, the A values should go on your transverse. So you look at the y-axis for your A values. 
So here it looks like you're going up one and down one. So therefore, A is one. And if you look at the x-axis, the other side of the box, all right, if you go across, you're going across one. So that means my B value is also one. Fill those in the equation and you're done with this problem. So you get y squared over one squared minus x squared over one squared equals one. And you can simplify that to y squared minus x squared. And there you go. All right, I'll give you 30 seconds more and I'll scroll down to the next one and our last example. Okay, here we go. So first you want to look at which axis is the transverse axis, the x axis is. Because the curves, they're opening out along the x-axis, right? You could also think of it as the curves have symmetry over the x-axis. So x-axis is transverse. So that means we're going to be using the equation where x is first. All right, so we would use that. So now look at where A is. A is under the x. So on the x-axis, that's where you're going to find A's. So that means this point here, that's at five. And this point here is at negative five. They, they should be you know, uh, the same number, but opposite. So that means we have A equals five. And B, all right? So if you look at the top of the box, it looks like two and negative two. So B would be two. And then we fill them in to the equation. So we get x squared over 5 squared minus y squared over 2 squared equals 1, which is x squared over 25 minus y squared over 4 equals 1. And there's your equation of the hyperbola. OK. Um, and you don't have to write the equations of the asymptotes. That's not necessary. OK. All I want is the standard form of the hyperbola. Well, you can see there in the graph how, how the asymptotes fit into the corners of the box, all right? And then the edges of the curve just kind of meet those lines as they extend outward. Okay, so that's, that's that. All right, so uh, before any of you start signing off, uh, just as a reminder, tomorrow is Thursday. So remember, Thursdays are our test days. So, so tomorrow, we'll have test or exam two. And again, it'll be 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Okay, so you just sign on at six and, and just do everything exactly the same as last time. Uh, where you just upload your solutions like on loose leaf, something like that. Um, also, the one thing I want to note is uh, for multiple choice problems, just give me the letter, all right, because um, I could tell some of you didn't read the directions on the last exam, which is fine. Um, but you, you don't have to show work for multiple choice problems, just your final answer, which is a letter, okay? Um, also, and just like last time, all right. If you can upload tonight's lab by noon tomorrow, I'll give you another bonus of five points. All right. So if you upload the lab by noon, no later. Okay. So that's for tomorrow. And now for the rest of class tonight, if you're going to stick around, we'll just finish the lab. All right. And this way, if you stick around, you finish it, you can upload it, you can earn your bonus points. Okay. Um, 
Oh, one other thing I want to say about the bonus points of the five points, you do have to have every problem completed to get the bonus points. So if you just upload what you have so far and it's incomplete, I won't give you the bonus of five points. So make sure when you turn in your lab for tomorrow, all the problems are done. And if it's turned in before noon, then I will give you five points. Okay, so that's it from me. Uh, if you want to stick around and work uh, as one big group uh, or ask me questions about anything uh, on the lab or about the exam tomorrow, you can stick around. But if you don't need to, then feel free to sign off. Class is officially over.